individuals and and for uh, communities. Okay, we got the we got the recording started. Great. So ethics is the process of determining or discovering the morally right and wrong for individuals and communities. And uh, I've suggested to you that there are four components uh, to ethics. Uh, first is character. What is the character of the person? Um, the motive, the purpose, the intent uh, of whatever action they take or deed. And then fourthly, what is the outcome? What's the consequence? So when we think about uh, any kind of uh, ethical issue or ethical process, moral process, we want to think about those four components. So, you know, we have we've established this kind of basic understanding. I just wanted to remind you of that. Um, but today, I want to talk about three key questions that we build our ethics upon or, or we might say inform um, what ethical position we're going to take. And, you know, certainly I, I thought about I wanted to start every one of these talks by giving you some bad examples of ethics. Um, and I, I was a little bit at a loss just because there's so many, right? <laughs> Unfortunately, there are so many. Um, you know, we've in the past 24 hours been thinking a lot about the beating death of Ty Tyree Nichols. Um, we've been constantly hearing about Congressman George Santos and how he has completely lied about everything concerning his life. Um, we've had three mass shootings in California this past week. Uh, it's 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 a it's a you know they're they're examples all around us of poor ethical uh, behavior. So this this is a vital topic, and so I want to take up these three foundational questions: Where do morals come from? Um, what is the benefit of morality? And whose life is it? So let's go to the first one. Where do ethics come from? Where do ethics come from? Where do we look um, for our morality? And there's essentially we can boil it down to two options. Um, the first is, is that uh, is naturalism. Uh, so all ethical systems are founded upon one of two basic assumptions, either naturalism or supernaturalism. So naturalism views life on a horizontal level. In other words, there's nothing outside the world as we know it. It's a materialistic view. Um, there's no spiritual realm to life. Whereas a supernatural orientation says there's more to this world than we encounter with the five senses. There is a supernatural dimension, a transcendent dimension um, to the cosmos, to life. Um, uh, there is a spiritual dimension to it. And depending on which camp you're in, it's going to profoundly affect how you think about you know, ethics. If, if, you're in, if you're in naturalism, um, then our values and morals derive from environmental or evolutionary impulses. That's, that would be the understanding. And that, that happens, ethics is essentially there to aid uh, our ability to live together, uh, to aid our, our collective and individual survival. So in, in naturalism's view, morality is invented. There's, there's nothing absolute about morality. It's created um, by human beings. And, and, you know, I say created by human beings consciously or unconsciously. It's created by human beings. It's totally on a horizontal plane. Uh, in contrast, the supernaturalism says that ethics come from some kind of religious figure or system that brings a transcendent foundation to our morality. In other words, morality is outside of ourselves. Morality is absolute. And no matter what we think about things or what's happening on this planet, <laughs> there are moral standards that exist apart uh, or above us. Uh, and our society, all right? So that would be a, a supernaturalism uh, orientation. So whichever foundational assumption you embrace is going to completely color 
your morality and how you do ethics. So in naturalism's approach to ethics, you know, we're seeking to develop ethics on the basis of morality itself. It's saying that that the givenness of morality is a sociological phenomenon. Um, it's not a givenness in an absolute sense. Naturalism's premise is that human beings do not have an innate moral sense, but because we are free and thinking beings, we're able to make choices. And these choices can be overwhelming and difficult to decide between. All right, so follow the, the logic here. Naturalism is saying, there, there's no built-in sense of right or wrong. Human beings have no moral sense, but we constantly encounter issues where we have to make a decision one way or another. And morality arises, ethics arise as a way to help us cope with that decision-making. Morality is seen as an evolutionary survival technique. It, it helps to limit our choices and make it more possible for us um, to easily move forward uh, in life. So here's a great comment by a Christian ethic, ethicist, uh, Jay Duma. He says, choosing from an unlimited number of possibilities is so difficult that it becomes necessary to limit that number. That is what morality is concerned about. Now, Duma is a Christian ethicist, but he's explaining the naturalism perspective. Uh, morality offers a limited number of rules of conduct that relieve people of the need to weigh and determine every time anew what should and should not be done. For example, marriage is a relationship of commitment to one partner. We don't need to look repeatedly for a new partner. Such a permanent relationship can contribute to security and stability. One can use the creativity and energy saved thereby for doing other things. So, in other words, a naturalism perspective would say, well, monogamous marriage is a way to limit our choices so that we can put our energies to other things, um, that we're not just moving from partner to partner all the time and constantly on search for a new uh, partner to, to reproduce with. Um, now, what that does is it immediately moves us into relativism. And again, quoting Duma, he says, morality cannot remain the same forever. But when an accepted morality begins to work in a way that constricts rather than liberates, then we need to abandon it. Hence, <laughs> the abandonment of monogamous heterosexual marriage that we, we see today and have seen for some time. You know, it, it's the naturalism to say, well, society is stable and safe enough now that uh, we don't really need to be committed to one partner. We can we can play the field in various ways now um, because we've sort of solved other issues that monogamy was helping us to solve. I hope this is making sense to you. So in the view of naturalism, the human person is the center of reality. I, it's all about me. <laughs> it's all about me. Um, now, in contrast, the supernatural approach to ethics um, by definition, is transcendent. It, it's outside of us. So it comes to us, morality comes to us via special revelation through an example or through a set of teachings. Um, and, you know, here the person looks for a standard and source of morality that's not tied to the world around you. It's not being evolutionarily driven. Um, it, it's looking vertically, it's looking outside of ourselves, not simply horizontally. And so with this approach, um, one would critique any religious or philosophical ethical system uh, and anything that, that is purporting to be supernatural or transcendent. You would look for how it is coherent and how it corresponds. In other words, is it internally uh, consistent? Does is, is it coherent? Does it hold together? You know, does it does it fit together like a jigsaw puzzle? And does it correspond to the world around us? Does it make sense of the world around us? Now, I can say a lot more about these two concepts, and I may do that later on in this series. These are important concepts, but I wanted to put that out for you that we we always want to critique an ethical system uh, by whether it is coherent and whether it has correspondence. So uh, Christian ethics then uh, is uh, supernaturally rooted. 
Christian ethics is supernaturally rooted. It's it's transcendent. It has a vertical orientation, not simply a horizontal orientation. It's not human centered, but God centered. It doesn't start with the human person, uh, but it starts with God. It looks vertically, not horizontally. And the person and nature of God is our foundation um, for ethics. Uh, Romans 11 verse 36 says, for from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. So you, that's just a wonderful statement of saying it's all about God, right? It's all about God. So Christian ethics are grounded in transcendence and guidance for ethics is special revelation based. All right, it's grounded in the transcendent person of God who incarnates um, in Jesus Christ. And we are uh, given ethical information through his word, through special revelation of uh, the Bible. So that's the first uh, key question. Where do ethics come from? Where are we rooting our ethics? Is it going to be in naturalism or is it going to be in supernaturalism? And I hope you can see that whichever assumption you begin with is going to dramatically color your ethical system. It's, it's important to note, let me just say again, it's important to note that Christian ethics are grounded upon the person of Jesus and a personal, personal commitment to him, not simply uh, his uh, example of his life and his teaching. I mean, a lot of people want to look at Jesus and say, oh, well, he's a great example, or I like his teaching. But true Christian ethics uh, has to do with who Jesus is and our commitment to him. Uh, it, it, it is much deeper, much more substantial than simply liking his example and teaching as, as important as this example and teaching it. So then, you know, out of this foundational question, two important, two more important questions arise um, that drive people to certain ethical systems. The first one is what's the benefit? What is the benefit? What is the benefit? So in naturalism, the question becomes, what is the benefit to me? How does this ethical system benefit me? And if you are the center of the ethical system, essentially, if it's, if it's naturalism, if it's about making your life good, then your ethics can change, you know, depending on circumstances and what your desires are at that moment in that time. Um, you might say, well, what are what is the ethical system doing for this society at this point in time? It becomes a very pragmatic approach. What's what will be the outcome? Uh, it's result oriented. And it's always looking at what's what's the greatest outcome for me and what's the greatest outcome for my my tribe, uh, my society, since we're answerable only to ourselves. Ultimately, right. We're only answerable to ourselves. So the benefit to me or my group is the supreme moral principle or the goal upon which I operate. But for Christian ethics, what's the benefit? Well, there's, there's really three benefits we're looking at. Is God being glorified? Are others being blessed? And, I, and am I becoming more like Christ? See, these are much more outward oriented, much more transcendent. Ultimately, it's not about me. It's about God. Is he being glorified in my ethical behavior? Is my morality reflecting praise upon him? And are, is my morality blessing others? And ultimately, is my morality um, causing me to become more Christ-like? Right? This is the way Christians think about things. And this deeply affects issues and how we perceive them. Uh, you know, it, you can see that naturalism approach and a Christian supernaturalism approach to ethics will bring very different answers concerning things like uh, euthanasia, uh, sexuality, drug use, gun ownership and gun violence, social justice, and on and on. These are going to be shaped very differently depending on uh, which ethical system we are uh, adhering to. 1 Timothy 4, 7 and 8 says, but have nothing to do with worldly fables fit only for old women. 
On the other hand, discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness, for bodily discipline is only of little profit, but godliness is profitable for all things, since it holds promise for the present life and also um, for the life to come. So, you know, we see here that uh, I love this uh, statement again by Duma. He says, our horizon for determining benefit extends beyond the grave, extends beyond the grave. Um, because we're thinking about God being glorified. We're thinking about growing in Christ. We're thinking about blessing others. You know, we're thinking about the kingdom of God, which is blessing for this life. Yes, but also for the life to come. You know, as Paul says, he he's not putting down bodily discipline you know he's not putting down working out but he says that's a, it's of limited value whereas godly discipline uh, is good for this life and the life to come so our horizon for determining benefit what a, what's the benefit of this ethical system extends beyond the grave in mark 10 jesus said truly i say to you there's no one who's left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or farms for my sake and for the gospel's sake, but that he will receive a hundred times as much now in the present age, houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and farms, along with persecutions, which he hadn't said that, but <laughs> there it is, and in the age to come, eternal life. So Jesus says, look, by following him, and that's our the, the core of our ethical system, you know, Jesus, being like Jesus, being Jesus-focused, um, the Jesus ethic that we talked about earlier in this series, it will bring benefit to our lives here and now. Now, this is, don't mistake, this is some kind of prosperity gospel thing being offered here. Um, when he says there will be present blessing of houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children, you know, he's talking about being a member of the church, being a part of the people of God um, and uh, the resources and the, and the relationships that are there available to you in Christ. Um, and he says, but there will be persecutions as well. So this is not, you know, give your life to Jesus and everything will be a bed of roses. Um, but he says it'll be good. It'll be good in this life, and you'll have eternal life, the life to come. So whose benefit? Who? What's the benefit of this ethical system? You know, for Christians, um, it's beyond ourselves. It focuses on God and others. And then the third question, whose life is it? <laughs> whose life is it? Or, or, or to say, who's, who does my life belong to? Well, the non-Christian ethic, the naturalism ethic, says my life belongs to me. My life belongs to me. And so I can determine whatever I want to do with my life, with my body. Um, it's, it's up to me. right? And you know that drives a lot of our discourse these days. Um, there's a certain degree to which you know, that's legitimate. Um, but at the end of the day, the Christian says my life belongs to God. My life belongs to God. It doesn't, doesn't belong to me. In 1 Corinthians 6.19, I'm not going to take the time to turn there, but I encourage you to look at these texts on your own. There, Paul talks about our bodies, our very bodies, being a temple. And he says, you are not your own. Our bodies, our very bodies belong to God. We are not our own. So what we do with our bodies, what we do with our lives, we need to ask about God first. We need to ask him what we should be doing. In Romans 14, 7 and 8, Paul, that's where Paul talks about um, we live and die for the Lord. Whether we live, we live for Christ. Whether we die, we die for Christ. We live or die for the Lord. We are the Lord's. So again, this deeply affects this approach. Answering these three questions deeply affects how we're going to think about issues of sexuality, what we do with our bodies, uh, of drug use, right? Of uh, how we relate to others in terms of uh, uh, violence or anger. Uh, you know, it, it's going to affect every ethical issue um, if, we're if we answer these three foundational questions from a naturalism perspective or from a supernaturalism um, perspective. 
So, you know, let me wrap this up. There's a lot more, of course, that can be said. There's probably questions coming to your minds. I, I want to encourage you again to feel free to email me. And there's the email address, v101xian at yahoo.com. Um, or you can uh, uh, get your questions to Noel or Hannah uh, or Pastor Wong and uh, they can forward them on to me. I'm, I'm happy. I, I promise you I will answer every question that comes to me. I will either answer it from the pulpit in a sermon without naming you. I won't embarrass you. Um, but if it doesn't really fit in the message I <laughs> need to bring, uh, I will certainly answer you uh, personally. Um, so feel free, if you have any any questions at all, um, feel free to reach out to me uh, and uh, ask me. Because um, these three, the, again, these three questions, where is morality from? What's the benefit? And whose life is it? Um, will, will shape our ethical understanding on a host of issues. And, you know, let me give you a good example of ethics. Uh, I just came across this recently. Uh, the Roy's Report is a wonderful resource for Christian reporting on good and bad, what's happening in the church today. And uh, here was something that just really struck me. Um, here's this church, if you look in the left-hand box there, um, they had just done a, a big uh, renovation of their building. And, Something didn't sit right with the congregation of Akimus Community Church after they spent $1.6 for much-needed renovations to their nearly 185-year-old building. And then quoting uh, the pastor, we really needed to have structural and, and accessibility and asbestos abatement and a number of issues done, said the Reverend Rick Blunt. Um, but then he says, it's just that it's not in the DNA of this congregation to spend money on itself. As a counterbalance, Blunt made a goal of forgiving 1.6 million in medical debt in their community through uh, RIP Medical Debt, a nonprofit based in Long Island, New York. And then there's another, there's a picture here of a church that did, uh, another church that did a similar thing. Um, and this isn't just for the members of the congregation. This was for everybody in the community. They reached all kinds of people, uh, forgiving them uh, debt from medical bills that that they uh, they had. You know, paying off their debt for them. Um, so that's a wonderful you know example of being informed about you know a godly attitude about how you're handling your stuff, how you're handling your wealth, and looking to bless others. And to my mind, that's growing in, in Christ-like um, character. So look, as, as a non-Christian, if you're, if you're listening uh, today, this is, this is challenging stuff. You know, to, to move from a naturalism ethic into a supernaturalism or Christian ethic, it's challenging. It's going to challenge you. It, it may be uncomfortable, um, but I want to say it's good. It's good because it's true because it's a morality rooted outside of ourselves. It's a morality that is absolute and timeless and universal and cross-cultural, right? Turning out of yourself, turning away from what's in it for me attitude that's so much in the world around us, um, you'll find a much more uh, rich and robust lifestyle if you will consider giving your life to Jesus Christ. And for us who are Christians, you know, we need to think carefully about what it means to live in the world as Christians. We so easily imbibe a naturalism perspective, and it takes a little work to think through issues and to search the scriptures and to consult pastors and theologians and ethicists and, and uh, to really wrestle. And, and all these questions, all these ethical questions, some of them are very difficult, and Christians will sometimes disagree. But nonetheless, we should be striving to say and to live, my life doesn't belong to me. It belongs to God. My ethics come from above. My ethics are communicated to me most profoundly through his word, um, the Bible. Christian ethics are out of this world. They're out of this world. Christian ethics are supernaturally based. They're rooted in the person and work of Jesus Christ. Christian ethics are other-focused 
seeking the benefit of all, not simply myself. And Christian ethics are informed by an understanding that our lives belong to the one who has both created us and redeemed us. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that you have not uh, abandoned us um, to our sinful nature, but that you have come and saved us, Lord Jesus. We, we were coming out of the Christmas season where we've been celebrating your incarnation. And we thank you that you have given us the revelation of your person and of your word that we might know how to live. And Lord, we pray that we might live as vertical people, as supernatural people, who have a supernatural orientation in our ethical life, and that we might walk uh, as moral people who are bringing glory to your name, blessing others, and growing in Christ's likeness. Amen.